Hello and welcome to the teacher's staff room and we are back once again with another pre-release presentation for the CTEC Business Level 3 for Unit 1, the business environment and the exam date for this particular pre-release is the 14th of May 2024. Now, it may well be that you're watching this without this particular PowerPoint, and that's absolutely fine. You can make your own PowerPoint or own document and add your research to your own document. You don't necessarily have to have this particular PowerPoint. But if you do have this PowerPoint, then obviously you can stop this at your own pace throughout and update your PowerPoint with the bits in that you need to complete. Um, for anyone else, um, if you want to get hold of a copy of the PowerPoint, then if you visit www.test.com, I will leave a link below in the description where you can get yourself a copy for a small charge. So let's um, get started. But before we do, I just want to say that in terms of copyright, all of the information within this presentation is for fair use and educational purposes only. All of the content for the pre-release and specification are used as demonstrative purposes and can be found at www.ocr.org.uk. This is not intended to replace published information from the warding body. It's simply a tutorial on how you could go ahead and prepare yourself for the section B of the examination. I'd like to do a quick shout out to my business students in year nine, year 10 and in year 11. So hello, <laughs> you know who you are. So um, if you're watching this, then uh, well, thank you for watching. And um, also, if uh, you're not one of my students and you're watching, I would really love to know, is this the first time you are sitting this exam? So this is your first attempt or is this a resit for you? So if you can obviously comment down below and let me know because I am really interested. And of course, if you want to come back and let me know how you did in your exam as well, once you've got your results, I'd absolutely be thrilled to know what grade you got. So here we go then, let's kick this off with um, the businesses that we are going to be looking at for this research. So um, I've picked five this time. And just to say as well that this particular release from OCR is a quite complicated one. Um, I have seen ones which are slightly easier uh, where we've used one or two businesses. But this one, it felt that actually we probably had to use five businesses to cover all of the themes that OCR wanted um, covered. So if you haven't heard of Taylor Wimpy, they're a national house building construction company. So we're going to be taking a look at them. We then have made.com, which is online furniture store. We have our friends at McDonald's. Um, they always seem to feature a lot in my um, videos, but they are a nice business to have a look at. And of course, I'm sure all of you have been to McDonald's at some point. And JD seems to feature in, in my videos as well. So we're going to take a look at JD Sports again. And then the last one, which you should be quite familiar with, is Amazon.co.uk. And they, as I say, they're the five businesses that the research is going to be based around. And I just want to say as well that if your teacher is um, asking you to research different businesses, then obviously you stick to what your teacher is, is asking you to do. Um, but if your teacher is happy for you to go with these five businesses, then obviously, you know, you can use this um, video to help you prepare for your research. So as a reminder, then 14th of May is the exam and it's a two hour examination. The exam is split into three sections. So um, what we see is the section A, which is a multiple choice section with 20 questions. Section B is what we're looking at today. And this comprises of short answer questions and questions requiring more extended responses based on pre-released research brief. So this is what has come from OCR for you to actually research. So that's what we're gonna cover in this video. 
And then section C comprises of short answer questions and questions requiring more extended responses based on an unseen scenario. So we are talking about a case study there. So you're going to get a case study for that section C and everything that you will answer will be based on that particular case study they've put forward. And hooray, we can use a calculator. And that's because obviously there is some finance within that paper. Uh, but it's nice to know that you can take a calculator in. And as a reminder, when you uh, get the grades for this examination, the grading is graded at near pass, which is still a pass. So that's really good. If you can achieve a near pass, it means you don't need to resit the exam unless you want to obviously improve your grade. Then we see the pass, the merit and the distinction. So we don't have a distinction star coming off of this exam. But what we do have is that this unit is worth two passes or two merits or two distinctions. So the points that you can achieve are doubled because it's a big unit. It's 120 guided learning hours. So here's the instructions for the research and the rest of the PowerPoint. So this is obviously written for my students. So as part of your examination in May, you are required to carry out your own research. Use this document to place all of your research in one place. You may add pages and anything that will help you revise. So tables, pictures, graphs. And I would add there as well, if you find a link on YouTube that explains something, then, then use that for your revision. You know, however you like to revise and how you retain information, you can add anything you like to this PowerPoint or to your own revision notes as we go forward. And it goes without saying, the more research you do, the more prepared you will be for the questions in the section B of the exam. And that's really important as well, because although we're preparing this research based on what OCR have asked us to look at, we don't know the questions. So we do not know until we open the paper what is going to come up in relation to these themes that, that we're looking into. So if you have done your research and uh, maybe even a little bit a bit more around the subject as well you're going to be more prepared for whatever angle of question that's going to come up because at this stage to be fair it is a guessing game we can look at the specification look at what they've asked us to revise we can apply it to businesses but just to obviously make you aware it's never going to be 100 percent because we don't know what the questions are now, for my students, it might be the same for your teacher. I make this a mandatory piece of work. So I say to students, you cannot sit the exam unless this is complete. Because let's face it, you're going to have a third of the exam that you're not going to have any marks for. And that would be a total shame. So, you know, put as much effort into it as you can. So here we go then. This is what has come from OCR for the CTEC Unit 1 exam. So you should carry out your own research on the themes given in the research brief. You are advised to research a number of different types of businesses. Your research will help you prepare for your examination. Your research is only for your own use. You must not bring your notes into the examination. A clean copy of the research brief will be provided in the examination. So that is a very clear point there. Although you're going to be putting all of this research together, you must not take it into the examination hall. It is simply that you're going to have to try and remember this information for when those questions come up in the paper. So here's our themes then. So the first theme, stakeholder groups and the degree of influence they possess. A venture capitalist as a long-term source of finance for a business. How technological factors affect a business. How organisations maintain financial control. And non-financial factors that contribute to the success of a business. So the questions in section B of the examination will require you to draw on the knowledge and understanding which you have gained while researching these themes. So let's 
get started. So a very thoughtful person here. Hopefully that's you right now, starting to think about the research you're going to undertake. So everything from here on in is about researching those themes and hopefully I've made it as simple for you as possible. And remember, pause throughout the video if you need to, uh, but particularly because I probably will be speaking quite fast just to try and keep the video as short as possible because you don't want to be here for days. But let's get started. So here we go then. So the first theme, so the stakeholder groups and degree of influence they possess. Now, when we look at the specification, this comes under learning outcome five, which is about understanding the relationships between business and stakeholders. So what I've done here is I've just drilled down the specification. So who are stakeholders and then drilled down again in terms of the ways in which different stakeholder groups attempt to alter business behaviour. And then going up to 5.3, we then start to see roughly where they're going with this particular theme. Because if we look at the first bullet point under business responses include, we see the first bullet point says, the degree of influence stake, sorry, individual stakeholders possess is likely to determine how businesses respond to individual stakeholder objectives. So what is really clear to me in looking at this theme that they've picked is that you absolutely have to have the background information on stakeholders to be able to then understand the degree of influence they have on the uh, business and obviously how the business responds depending on how much influence these stakeholders have. So what I've done in the subsequent slides is giving you the kind of theory behind it. So here we have a slide on internal stakeholders. So at the top there, you've got the definition and then I've broken it down to who the internal stakeholders are. And just be aware as well that trade unions do come under internal stakeholders just because uh, you may have a representative that sits within your organisation, even though they are an external body. Then slide uh, on the next slide, sorry, is our external stakeholders. So as you can see, there's many more external stakeholders. And really and truly, you know, this is probably uh, more in line with a private ownership type business. Of course, if we were looking at public ownership, then you would see probably slightly different stakeholders uh, because they, they obviously um, are serving the public in terms of uh, their objectives. Um, so for example, NHS, you may well see some other organisations they're linked to that are their stakeholders. But these typically tend to be, as I say, the sort of private owned uh, business and their external stakeholders. So then what I've done is I've, I've included what the stakeholder objectives are, just as a, a recap, in terms of where we're going with this. So as you can see here, we've got the stakeholders down the left hand side and then you've got what the stakeholder objectives are. And then obviously we have to start thinking about what is the conflict between what the stakeholders are trying to achieve and what obviously the board of directors are trying to achieve. And let's face it, in a private business, the board of directors are concerned with high profits, um, the performance of the business, the return on the investment for the shareholders. And that is going to conflict with the stakeholder needs. For example, if we look at customers at the top there, customers, they want value for money, low prices, good service. Well, all of that costs money. That costs money to the business, which means uh, the directors can't have their high profits if they're satisfying those customers with their low prices and excellent customer service. So there has to be um, some kind of balance in terms of you know, just how much low prices does the business give because otherwise they're not going to have profit and the shareholders are not going to be very happy. Now, I'll let you know now that the uh, stakeholders that we're going to be focusing on for the research is our local community. So if we just take a look here and remember, you can pause this video for local community. They are concerned with the local environment. So they want a nice place to live in. They don't want um, 
rubbish and noise pollution and uh, thick smog in the air they want to live in nice places just think about your own neighborhood for a minute and you know what what your neighbors um, want in terms of where where you live of course we want uh, this clean environment but also we want access to good roads good schools good hospitals uh, transport links and things like that and with that obviously we want jobs as well local jobs are really really important to local communities so we want this prosperity the more prosperity we have in our area the more opportunities there are um, and, and it's, it, it just goes round and round. That's just, you know, how the economy works. The more jobs you have, the more pay that's then flowing in the economy. And then you will be able to then enjoy buying additional luxuries and enjoying local services and eating out and things like that. And uh, before you know it, you've got a lovely neighbourhood that, that you live in and it's thriving. Now, if we look at the board of directors or owner objectives, now that's going to totally conflict with what owners want. So let's just pretend, for example, Tesco's want to build a brand new store right bang in the middle of a nice green field. Well, there you go. There's the conflict because that is totally going against what the local community want in terms of what they have in their neighbourhood. You're going to have construction sites. You're going to have construction vehicles, noise. Um, you know, it might start. They might start work really early in the morning to late at night, and there's going to be an increase in traffic. Then we have an increase in pollution, rubbish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the conflict is that they want quiet, unspoiled neighbourhoods without construction sites. Well, that obviously is nice. But that completely goes against the objectives of Tesco's. So in terms of conflict, we have to obviously come to some compromises. And that is what this theme is about. It's about what is the conflict and then how much influence do the local community have over this conflict. Now, we're not going to look at Tesco's. As I said at the beginning, we're going to look at Taylor Wimpy in terms of the conflict that happened within that business on this slide you can pause this and just if you want to take down any notes but again there's a little bit of information there in terms of how the business will respond depends on the degree of influence from the stakeholder and again just looking at the process of dealing with um, conflict and how businesses respond there is four stages here or four four steps that a business can take so first of all if conflict arises then all businesses should be identifying and recording and managing conflicts and they can use their business grievance procedures to do that so complaints can come into the business and they can be heard um, businesses will have other um, policies in place that will deal with any conflict from any of their stakeholders as well. And then number two, it's really important that businesses set clear standards and have written policies for, for example, if a problem was to arise, how is that then solved? Um, what what do they do in terms of if they want to expand and build? How do they keep those stakeholders um, in the loop or how do they communicate to them um, do they have meetings with them so they will have um, policies in place to actually think about minimizing the risk it's about minimizing the risk of conflict so if you can think about the risks that may come up and then you can obviously plan for trying to minimize those risks in anything that the business does and then number three find an alternative way forward so this is key. This may be the compromise which is acceptable for the stakeholders because you're going to be battling it out. Um, you know, if the local residents do not want a new Tesco store and then they're going to reject planning permission, that is a high degree of influence from those stakeholders because it can determine whether the planet, uh, you know, the building goes ahead or not. So 
there has to be a compromise from the business. So again, their policies and procedures will dictate how they get to that compromise and whether they meet with the stakeholders and communicate with them and what have you. And then going forward, better and more communication with stakeholder groups. So keeping everyone in the loop, being transparent, being trustworthy so that the, the, the sort of doors to communication are open and there's a whole level of trust around that business and what their intentions are and what their objectives are and that people are aware the direction that the business is going and but they take them stakeholders along with them as well. So here we go then. So this is Taylor Wimpy. Now I do recommend you obviously pause. I'm just going to whiz through this in terms of what's going on here. Um, but you are going to pause and obviously take your notes from this case study on Somerdale and Keenshum. Um, just to kind of brief you quickly, there is conflict. So the local community, you can see a really nice photo in the top right. They um, did not want this development to be built at all. OK, so remember, they've got a high degree of influence because in terms of getting planning permission from the council to be able to build this um, residential uh, development, the, the locals get a say in, in what happens and whether planning goes through and their views will be heard by the local councillors. And therefore, they could disagree and they did disagree with this planning going forward because, again, they didn't want it to spoil their local community. Um, it was a lovely sort of green area. You can see some trees there. And again, it's just another business coming in and making profit and not really thinking about the landscape and, and the local people that live there. So that's where the conflict arose. So again, you can pause this. So part of the uh, negotiations and the uh, compromise is that Taylor Wimpy had to listen to what these stakeholders were saying because they had this high level of influence. So as you can see here, a thousand visitors, so a thousand members of the community came to view the plans. They would have been putting their views forward. They would have, you know, been um, raising queries and questions and, you know, arguing whichever bits that they were not happy with. And therefore, Taylor Wimpy had to respond. They would have had their own internal policies on how to deal with this. And therefore, as part of the negotiations, Taylor Wimpy said that they would... Um, build some really lovely community open spaces, some riverside walks, some wide pavements in order to find a suitable way forward. So what I have done here as well is I have put the link through so you can go and read that case study in full if you want to or if you've not got this PowerPoint, if you simply go to www.taylorwimpy.co.uk you can type and do a search for this case study and it will come up anyway. So this planning effectively did go through, it did get built, but not without that conflict and that high degree of influence from the local community. So in terms of your research then, you must be absolutely clear on what has happened in this scenario. And so what I've done here is included a slide where you can then type in the answers to these questions or you can make your own notes. Um, if you haven't got this PowerPoint, do it on your own document. So you absolutely need to understand what stakeholders are affected due to this housing development. And remember, there could be more than one stakeholder group there as well. So just double check, look back through, make sure you know, for example, that there could have been employees that were affected or there could have been other external stakeholders that were affected, like suppliers, for example. Um, so think again about what each of those stakeholders are trying to achieve and potential conflicts that might be relevant to this case study, although we're focusing on um, local community. Again, because we just don't know what questions are going to come up. 
Then number two, what are the objectives of the local community and the owners in this case study? So again, refer back to that table and see what you can see through that case study and answer that question. What influence do they have on this particular business? So I've talked about planning permission and local community can reject planning permission. Um, and so that is the line that will help you obviously write down for that particular question. Why did it cause conflict? So again, I think we're pretty clear on how you attempt to answer that one. And how did Taylor Wimpy manage the conflict? So again, how did they get that planning through? So go back, have a look, pause it, visit the website if you need to, um, and then you should be able to answer those questions. But as I say, maybe have a look at the other stakeholders as well, just that in case a question comes up that's not about local community, might come up and it might say, how are the suppliers affected in terms of the level of influence they had with your your business that you've researched and in which case you're a bit more prepared in case that particular question comes up now what i like to do is to include an example answer i haven't done this throughout just for this first one and it's not to say that this you know you need to use this as your own answer but you might write one better than what i have to be fair because i did this very very quickly but it gives you a nice structure to follow so Taylor Wimpy has had to deal with many stakeholder groups when building new houses. One group, which were the local community, has had a lot of influence on a building project. The local community at Summersdale did not want a construction site in their local area. They were able to affect the planning by rejecting proposals. Therefore, Taylor Wimpy had to include community features to satisfy the local community. And of course there, when I say you can add your own detail, what did they include? Give some examples. You know, I talked about the wide pathways and the riverside walks. You know, I could have added more detail here, but in your answer, you can add more detail. This led to the stakeholders agreeing to the planning and Taylor Wimpy were able to build the houses, which led to more sales and more profit. So again, I've left you a little bit of space at the bottom there, or you can add another slide to have a go at writing the sort of model answer that you, in theory, would write if it came up about local community. Now, what is really important is the features of how we've structured this. So when we have structured this, we have talked about, obviously, Taylor Wimpy and the stakeholder groups. We've talked about the local community. We've talked about a bit of an example of what happened. But one of the most important elements to get you into the higher level of points is the lead to part. So the lead to part has to show that you understand the impact to the business. So if we take the last line, which lead to more sales and more profit. So you have to be prepared to know what the impact is. So that if we were looking at this at a bigger picture, so we've got the degree of influence. Well, if the businesses um, respond and negotiate uh, because they've got a high degree of influence, then that's good for business. Um, it shows that they're able to cooperate with their stakeholders. And if they do that, then they will be successful and it will lead to more sales and more profit. Now, it may lead to other things. It may lead to market share. It may lead to good reputation. It may lead to um, good uh, brand awareness or more brand awareness. Um, so... Don't just think sales and revenue all the time or sales and profit. There are other things that it can lead to for the business as well. But as I say, I'm going to, on the next one, give you the actual structure that you're going to follow. And then you're going to obviously have a have an attempt at writing your own answer. And again, try it with a different stakeholder. So, you know, add another slide and write it as if you're writing that suppliers are the business with a high degree of influence or the um i don't know the employees 
are the the stakeholders with the high degree of influence so just you know have a play around just so that you are fully prepared depending on what question comes up then we go to number two which is venture capitalist as a long-term source of finance for business and this was a tricky one in that it's not fairly straightforward in terms of where this theme is coming from of course we see it under um learning outcome seven which is why businesses plan and understanding why businesses plan and then of course the appropriate sources of finance and that's where we see venture capitalist so what i've done here and again pause at your own leisure but i've given you the um the theory behind venture capitalist and i've also reminded you it is an external long-term source of finance and when you're considering venture capitalists you really must consider what is the finance for so what is the purpose why would a business be using a venture capitalist is it because of what they're trying to finance is it because of the length of time that they need the money for so just have a little think in terms of why this could be a, a good source of finance depending on obviously what the business is up to so I've given you the definition there, the advantages and disadvantages of using this type of finance. Now, for this particular one, we're going to use made.com, but I've kind of taken a step back here to actually look at the company that they used. So made.com was actually um, sourced from a capital venturist company or capitalist venture company, depending on which way around you say it by um, pro founders they are a massive um, company they invest in a particular um, sort of industry and market which is all to do with tech and digital media so that is their specialization that where they were going and invest in in startups and what have you so uh, they mainly sit in London they have offices in London but they are all across Europe and they have business dealings and portfolios in Europe now some of the people or say people some of the businesses they've invested in so there's our made.com tweet deck easy car and um last minute.com as well and another one called bebo so you may have heard that you know they have got some pretty big companies on their books so um, as you can see as well, the investment level. So this is probably one of the reasons why companies turn to this particular business, because they will invest between 500,000 and about 2.5 million in terms of um, investment. So we're talking huge sums of money, which probably a bank would be like, no, not if you're a startup with no trading history. Um, but, you know, if you've got a really good business idea, that's what these venture capitalists are for, to get these businesses off the ground. As I say, particularly tech businesses, because um, there's lots of money to be made in technology. So it's a really great way to get some investment without going through a bank. So again, there's a little bit of information here because when you use a venture capitalist firm, you're not just getting the investment. So again, pause this, take your own notes or what have you, but you're getting a lot more. You're getting that specialist advice. You are getting, as it says here, the long-term partnership because it's a long-term source of finance. So when they put this money into your business, they're not going to just say, oh, well, you know, we want the money back in five years. They literally are investing for the future. It could be a very long time, you know, 10, 15 years maybe, because they understand it takes a while for a business to obviously get off the ground and, um, you know, grow and uh, become profitable. So you're getting a lot more. Um, and uh, remember as well that when you're um, investing, it may well be that you're handing over a share of your business. So this company here has, has actually made it quite clear that they will allow you to have your own autonomy. And that means that you can make your own decisions. And um, obviously, they're there for giving you advice. But on the same side, they want you to feel that you're still in control of your business. That's really important. And again, um, if you want to look at this particular business, if you just type profoundersCapital.com into Google, 
they will pop up. So here's the actual business we're going to focus on. So made.com, they are a business. They invested in this high quality furniture business, which, OK, isn't tech, but it's the platform that this was done. That's the technology that pro founders were interested in because they were connecting the furniture manufacturers so lots of different furniture manufacturers, probably over Europe and globally, to customers, which is a complete unique business model that we probably haven't seen before. Um, and because of that, it's created this brilliant online shopping experience for everyone involved. So that that's what I would suggest is why they um, invested in this business, uh, because that is their area of expertise, the technology side. And um, it was quite unique in that we've got manufacturers dealing direct with customers. So, of course, if you want to look at made.com as well, just, just go on their website. There's some information um, on there about their business as well that you might want to read into. But there's your slide then. So be prepared to, that you can answer these questions. So you must have a look and be understanding what venture capitalist is. And then why would a business choose this type of finance? What may be the drawbacks to this type of finance? So have a look at the disadvantages in that table. Um, Made.com used a venture capitalist to fund their startup. Why did they choose this type? So again, go back to those slides, have a little look and uh, make your assessment of why they chose, for example, this over a bank. And then what else did pro founders offer the business? So in addition to the finance, what else did they um, offer this business as an investor go, uh, going forward? So if you can answer those questions, I'll pretty much say that we're on the on the right lines to be able to cover that particular theme. Obviously, we don't know what questions will come up in the exam, but but certainly, you know, you're going to have a lot of information there um, to be able to put a answer together. And that's where you're going to do it on this slide here. So, again, I've given you a bit of space that you can practice having a model answer and I've given you the structure here. So what you saw with the Taylor Wimpy scenario, I've given you the actual exam structure you're going to use. So point so what is what is your point that you're making explain it out give an example and then leading to what's the impact to the business and i forgot to mention on the other slide as well the absolute key thing as well is application to the business so with taylor wimpy you were talking about um it would be about building projects, houses, construction, um, uh, big wide open spaces. That is all specific to that business. On made.com, your application must include, obviously, furniture, online shopping, technology, design. So that is then you applying this answer to this specific business. Um, you do lose points if you don't include application, so make sure that you do it. And with the leading to, again, just be thinking, what's the impact on made using a venture capitalist company? So what is the benefit? Why is that good? In which case, you know, we're going to see the increases in sales, revenue, market share, um, more customers, reputation, you name it, or, ex you know, expanding um, into new markets, something like that. But, but I'm sure that with your practice, you will take elements and then obviously bring it to a what is it leads to moment when you write it. And then number three, so how technological factors affect business. This comes under learning outcome six, understand the external influences and constraints on business and uh, sorry, and how businesses could respond. So fairly straightforward one, um, drilling it down to technological factors. And then under technological factors, we have got a little bit that says automation, communication, purchasing sales and mobile. So they're the elements where we see technology within businesses and 
a bit furious for you to sort of pause and read through and sort of take your notes. So this is what we're talking about. Hardware, software, mobile technology, automation and factory machines. So they're the things that possibly you could be asked um, around technological factors in section B. And here is our, I like to say our good friends, only because they pop up quite often, but McDonald's, we are going to focus on this one because you are all probably customers of McDonald's and you have all probably used the self-serve checkouts by now. And that is where technological factors have really impacted this business and it has been fantastic for McDonald's. So what I've done is included a link from where I got this research from. And of course, you can obviously pause it and write down and read your uh, this slide and take down your notes. But again, if you haven't got this um, PowerPoint to click on link, then you can just type that into Google and the um, article should come up. Now, what is slightly harder if you haven't got the PowerPoint, um, but the YouTube video that I've put above that is actually a YouTube video on the self-service checkout. So by all means, have a little look at that video just you know, to set in your mind what we are talking about if you're a little bit unsure. Now, here we go. We have the research for this theme slide. So you must be clear in knowing what is automation. Why would a business choose to use automation? What may be the drawbacks of automation? And what impact has automation had to the customer of McDonald's. So just be clear that you could answer any of those um, when it comes to um, the research theme for McDonald's. Of, of course, we're focusing on the self-serve checkouts, which is adding to this automation. Um, so yeah, see what you can do if you need to obviously do a little bit more research, if you feel that you need a bit more information, then just go to that link, um, type it into Google if you haven't got the PowerPoint and you will see that there's a vast amount of information on just how successful these self-serve checkouts are. And um, from what I understand, it was based on the fact that um, supermarkets had already introduced these self-serve checkouts and were seeing obviously quicker uh, productivity in terms of you know customers getting through checkouts um, and obviously McDonald's liked that idea and decided to uh, implement something along the same lines and then again I've got a slide here for you to uh, do your exam answer so again we're going to use point explain example leading to that's the structure you're going to use and you must talk about, again, for the application, the business products or industry. So that would be that in your answer, you're talking about fast food, self-service kiosks, technology. Um, and then again, when you're doing this, bring your answer to what it leads to for the business. So by implementing self-service checkouts, it has led to McDonald's seeing maybe an increase in customer satisfaction, increase in sales, increase in revenue. It could be increase in market share, increase in profit or lower prices because they don't need to obviously recruit as many people because they have uh, automation in place. So um, I'm sure obviously once you bring that together, it's going to look fantastic. So there's nice space for you to be able to do that. And um, just maybe be aware as well that, again, if you're not talking about self-serve checkouts, is there something else that McDonald's have done where they have introduced technology, i.e. mobile technology? I'm going to give you a clue there. So um, <laughs> I'm sure some of you even have the technology on your mobile. But, you know, think about other elements of technology that possibly could be questions is what I'm saying. And then number four, how organisations maintain financial control. And this was a tricky one as well, because it comes under why businesses plan. And as we drill down, we start to look at, um, you know, um, the, the sort of risks and uncertainty. And then into 7.1, it actually mentions uh, flawed business plans and poor financial control so obviously the theme is how they maintain financial control whereas this says 
poor financial control. So what can happen as a result of poor financial control? And the re- how we get financial control within a business is then in 7.3. So within the business plan, you would set out, for example, your cash flow forecast, your break even, um, your um, kind of projected um sort of costs for your startup and things like that so it's all about um, using those financial tools including you know even maybe your income statements and balance sheets what have you to make sure that the financial control of the business is really really good so we're going to look at that from a cash flow point of view so before we get there this is the kind of theory behind it so there we go what i just said basically that all of those things that we look at under finance is how we maintain financial control so break even cash flow forecast income statement forecast statement of financial position plans for growth okay so if you want to pause that and read that through um, but yes, it may well be. And as I say, we don't know the questions. We're going to focus on cash flow, but it might be worth knowing or revising about break even as a method of financial control or an income statement as a method of financial control. So um, just be aware, you know, we're taking a stab in the dark with cash flow, but it could be any of these things. So in terms of cash flow, then again, we've got a nice slide for you to actually pause and read through in terms of what happens if you don't manage your cash flow um, and, you know, what can happen to a particular business. So this is what happens. Poor financial control of your cash flow will lead to negative impacts such as business risk of business failure and you might become insolvent or bankrupt. So um, it's really, really important that we maintain this financial control and this is one of the tools that we do that. So I've included a cash flow here, cash flow statement, just in case um, you've forgotten what one looks like. I'm not going to go through the cash flow statement on this video. Of course, ask your teacher or watch another little YouTube video and they will obviously go through how you read the cash flow statement. Um, because it is critical to understand what is going in and out of the business in terms of money and how that can impact your sort of payments going forward or cutting down costs and making decisions um, that's going to maintain that financial control of the business. So just speak to your teacher there. I'm sure they will go through it for you. So JD is the business that we're going to focus on. So I've, again, I've put um, the link on there for anyone who's got the PowerPoint or you can just t- obviously type that into Google and you should get this um, up. And you, as I say, you don't need to know how to read the cash flow in order to answer this question. But I have pointed out here, um, this is an example of a cash flow statement from JD Sports. So you do not need to know how to read it all. But you will notice that the net change in cash flow is decreasing each, oh, sorry, decreasing each year. Here is where financial control is needed from this business. So it's a little bit small for even for my eyes on, on my um, iPad here. But um, you will see in in 2023, um, our net change in cash flow. So in 2023, it was 102.5. In 2022, it was 225.4, if my eyes are not too blind. And therefore, we have seen a decrease. So we would be starting to ask questions in terms of, you know, how are we managing this cash flow? Because obviously there's a change, a net change in cash. And what are the reasons behind that? And are we managing that change well? Because obviously, if that was to continue for 2024, going down and down and down and down, then we could end up in in serious problems. So we must make sure that we're really looking at... um, the finance of the business in terms of the sales coming in, so the revenue coming in, what we're paying out, and are there any management decisions that we can make so that we've got more coming in and less going out? And that's going to how we maintain financial control of this business. So here we go then. So here's the questions that you can obviously pause and write into this PowerPoint or write your notes or on your own personal document if you're doing it on a separate document. So what do we mean by financial control? 
Why is it important to JD Sports? What is the cash flow forecast statement? How can JD Sports use a cash flow statement to control the finance of a business? And what would be the impact to JD Sports of poor financial control? So all of those things that we've just looked at should be able to help you get a balanced bit of information in your mind that will help you with answering this theme. And here's the slide for you to then practice your answer. Again, we're going to use point explain example and leading to. And again, for your application, absolutely important that we're now talking about sports, clothing, retail, cash flow. So anything related to JD Sports for this one is what's going to turn it into a, an application that's going to get you points. And this is a, a, a funny one because it may be <clears throat> we're talking about bad financial control. If we're talking about bad financial control, then the impact to the business is going to be negative. So, for example, it might mean that we see decrease in sales, decrease in revenue, decrease in market share, decrease in profit, decrease in um, good reputation or business failure. OK, depending on what obviously the question is. Um, however, if it's about good financial control, then obviously it's going to be the positive. So we're going to be saying that it's lowering costs, increasing sales, increasing revenue, increasing profit. OK, so just be aware that depending on how the question's asked, you might be looking at the negative impacts or the positive impacts. But as I say, do your um, own little practice run here. And as I said, if you then want to think about break even or any of the other uh, bits mentioned for good financial control, then you might want to just play around with your answer and practice using um, a different type of financial control, just in case the question comes up. And then the last theme is non-financial factors that contribute to success of the business. We see this under learning outcome eight, which is to be able to assess the performance of the business to inform future business activities. Um, into 8.1, where we see we have the non-financial factor, then up to 8.1 to include present or sorry, past or present success or failure. So there's a slide here just to talk about that a little bit more. So by all means, if you want to pause, take your notes and read it through. And then I've included this slide. Um, so when we're talking about non-financial factors, obviously it is nothing to do with money. So here are common mistakes made by business. So there, I've got them all at 100% because it doesn't really matter what order that you, you were to write them in. So the first one on here, the business does not understand the market or consumer. So a key reason why businesses fail. Just think blockbuster video on that. Um, they didn't understand the market. They didn't understand the fact that um, videos were being um, sent uh, via streaming services. They didn't keep up with what was happening. Customers were not watching videos and DVDs. They were turning to online um, streaming so that that is ultimately you know one of the factors that led them to fail and that then feeds in as well to um, doesn't keep up with technology so um, we've seen obviously with the other theme um, if a business doesn't keep up with technology this is what customers are expecting these days we want fast efficient service and we want it now and businesses that do not keep up are the ones that get left behind um, just think about in COVID, I always say this to my students, Primark, the only retailer where you couldn't buy anything because they were completely shut down. They didn't have a functioning website where you can purchase items. Um, luckily, they're now catching up, um, but not to um, everywhere. Only certain stores can you do like a click and collect type service there. But hopefully, you never know, one day they might catch up. But if they don't, then it could be obviously very devastating for Primark because we expect that now. We want, um, you know, uh, online marketplaces that can deliver to us as quickly as possible. And then the last one then doesn't keep up with social trends. Again, you could bring Blockbuster back into that. Um, but when we talk about social trends, that is how people live their lives. What are people doing? So just be thinking about, you know, people living longer, you know, people having 
unhealthy lifestyles or healthy lifestyles um young people old people what's in fashion now you guys are great for that because you watch all the social medias and you know what the social trends are for example a few years ago vegan food was very very hot it's starting to tail off a bit now because it's it's become quite expensive for people to obviously buy whether it will completely go who knows but um basically it is a social trend um so it's just keeping an eye on what is the next hot thing that customers want and then providing products and services that meet those needs so if businesses don't do these then they are destined unfortunately to be unsuccessful so these non-financial factors will contribute to their downfall if they do these these non-financial factors will contribute to their success so again we don't know what the exam question is going to be is it going to be the mistakes or is it going to be the success in which case you can use this either way around and the business we're going to focus on is Amazon and they have been brilliant at non-financial factors. So again, pause this slide. But as you read through this, you will come to know that they have um, uh, in, understood their customers 100 percent, absolutely upgraded technology and i haven't put it on here but they have covered all three they've kept up with social trends you know in terms of the products that they sell on their marketplace and because of these non-financial factors they have a been able to actually grow their gross profits so it's increased by 14.1 percent which is amazing so it just goes to show that these non-financial factors are really important as well as financial factors for the success of business so it really is um, a, a good thing that businesses are doing these three things again i've got the link there it came from businessinsider.com so if you go there and do a search if you haven't got the powerpoint then obviously you can find that particular um, article that i found and um, just be aware as i say that it may well be that it comes in for the success of the business, but just be prepared as well. The question might say, what if they're not successful or something like that? So as I say, just, just sort of, you know, be prepared for both. So here is a slide then. What are the non-financial factors of Amazon success? What is the impact of knowing the non-financial factors? How does monitoring their business performance help them be successful? So hopefully all of the information on those previous slides is everything that you need to be able to obviously write the answers to those questions and any notes that you need to help um, answer that theme. And yet again, we have a space then for you to practice your answer. So we're using the point explain example leading to. And with this application, we have to be talking about e-commerce, retail, online shopping, next day delivery, because that is what Amazon is known for. So um, make sure you tailor your answer to your business. And then for the leading to, again, you know, what is the impact? Why is this brilliant for the business? So it could lower costs, increase sales, increase revenue, market share, good profit, good reputation. We could go on. So just think about what does this lead to having non-financial um, factors as part of success of business? What does that lead to? And as you saw from Amazon anyway, we can see the evidence that it increases profit. So um, that would be a pretty safe one to stick to. Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> but that was a long video. So um, that is all of the research themes completely covered. I really, really, really hope that you have um, taken something from this video. Um, if you're sitting that exam and it's helped you to actually put your research together ready for that examination in May. Um, if you um, obviously like what you see, please um, give it a big thumbs up because it does help. And of course, have a look at my other videos as well, because I have got how to answer the 12 mark questions. And that's for unit one and unit two. And I've gone through a distinction uh a distinction students 12 mark answer as well. And I will be posting other videos. 
so as I say, if you want a copy of the presentation, um, I will put a link in the description below. It's on www.test.com. And as I said at the beginning, please, please, please come back. Let me know what your grade is or tell me if this is a reset or the first time you're sitting this examination. But until next time, thank you very much for watching. I'll speak to you soon.